So what we are really talking about here is dysbiosis. And this is a general term. You know, people talk about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO. SIBO is a form of dysbiosis. And so when you understand this now, that SIBO is not just too much bacteria, SIBO is imbalanced as a form of dysbiosis. So as you see here represented in this graphic, you see all lots now of streptococcus and yersinia and aspergillus and peptococcus peptococcus and staphylococcus and candida species and Klebsiella and E. coli, none of these organisms on their own, when they're represented in a typical low level are particularly problematic, but it's when they overgrow out of control that we now have dysbiosis. But again, I just cannot stress enough how important it is to recognize that the root cause of dysbiosis is not the overgrowth it's the undergrowth of the healthy species. And this is really important because people come to see me all the time complaining of things like yeast overgrowth or SIBO. And what they want sometimes when they walk in, they want the most potent antifungal, you know, I've got to kill all these yeast. They want a potent antibiotic. And I explain to them, even if we got rid of all the yeast and all the Klebsiella and the, you know, Yersinia and whatever else, it would just come back if we don't rewild you. If we don't repopulate your gut with healthy, healthy species, they're all going to come back. And the main way we do that is not with a probiotic. It's by feeding the bacteria that are already there with the correct foods. Okay. So symptoms of dysbiosis in my neck of the woods as a gastroenterologist, this is what I'm typically seeing. Flatulence. People have an unpleasant taste in the mouth. Sometimes they have an unpleasant odor. They have bad breath. They have burping. They have abdominal pain. They have bloating almost always. They have a decreased appetite or sometimes they're eating too much and they have sugar cravings, especially if they have a lot of yeast species. They are nauseated. They have diarrhea, sometimes constipation. Sometimes they're having trouble gaining weight. Sometimes they're having trouble losing weight. So these are some of the gastrointestinal symptoms of dysbiosis. But dysbiosis doesn't just affect the gut. Dysbiosis affects the whole body. So what we see is this really intimate interaction between what's going on in your immune system, what's going on environmentally, primarily with your diet, and what's going on in your microbiome. And so, for example, dysbiosis is a root cause behind autoimmune diseases like type 1 diabetes, like inflammatory bowel disease, which is a Crohn's and colitis that I take care of mostly in my practice, what we call fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic steatohepatosis or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, Heart disease, atherosclerosis, I know you have had and will be having more brilliant cardiologists on during the program who will be talking about this. So heart disease really as a dietary disease, obesity, even cancer, colon cancer, for example, we know that there are major disruptions in the microbiome that we can link to certain types of colon cancer, certain kinds of lung disease, asthma allergies, atopy kind of allergic reactions, other autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis. And then actually, uh, I'll skip that one and see, tell you about the gut brain axis. So we talked about that earlier, but I want to remind you it's bi-directional. So neurotransmitters um, that can control stress and anxiety, mood behavior, et cetera, are very much influenced by what's going on in the microbiome. And similarly, what's going on in the microbiome is influencing the brain. So the brain is influencing motility, secretion, nutrient delivery, microbial balance, and the gut is influencing neurotransmitters, mood, stress, et cetera. So it's all very much related. Now let's go back to this slide about that I have here, which is just a simple line diagram showing in the last 70 years, this dramatic increase in the amount of autoimmune diseases, Crohn's disease, as I said, one of my diseases that I treat along with ulcerative colitis, type of inflammatory bowel disease, as well as multiple sclerosis, type one diabetes, asthma, we have virtually, we have a hundred, actually, I think the list is about 108 now different autoimmune diseases. And as you'll see from the slide, the increase, the, the incidence is increasing dramatically. 
And one of the things that's leading to this increase, I mean, in general, just our super sanitized lifestyle, the fact that we're killing off our microbes, we live inside in very sterile environments, we eat highly pesticized and processed food, and we take lots of medications, not just antibiotics, but acid blockers and non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. We consume artificial sweeteners, antidepressants can disrupt the microbiome. So we're living in a way with our food, with our medications, with our environment that are leading to dysbiosis and creating a lot of these problems. So when we think about gut microbial imbalance and how that leads to disease, we have host genetics, right? A lot of these diseases do have a genetic predisposition, but the predisposition is just the suggestion. It doesn't mean that disease is actually going to develop for a lot of these diseases. So we have mutations that can increase the risk, but we have lifestyle, diet, stress, early colonization. Were you born in a hospital via C-section? Were you vaginally delivered? So altered exposure to microbes. And then of course, medical practices, antibiotics, et cetera. So these things can all lead to dysbiosis and that can guide us to disease or health, depending on what our exposures have been. So let's dive right into the immune system. The immune system really is a network of cells and different proteins, and it's there to defend your body against pathogens and infection, and also against cancer, as you'll see. Our immune system records, our adaptive immune system, the one that's learned, records every encounter it has with different germs. And it has a library that can basically recognize and destroy those microbes when it encounters them again. And the really incredible thing about this is that if you are breastfeeding your baby, you, your breast milk can alter. If your baby is exposed to an infection, your breast milk changes because it goes to that little library in the immune system and then selects the right antibodies for whatever infection your baby has. If you as a mother have been exposed to it. So that's pretty amazing. And we've seen, for example, with COVID, that mothers who've had COVID can pass on those antibodies to their baby so that their baby is immune. So just an incredible system. And what's even more incredible is that most of your GI tract is actually in your digest. Most of your immune system is actually in your digestive tract. It is in these pears patches, which are these patches of lymphatic, immunologically active tissue around the small intestine. They're the, in the appendix, they're in the spleen. They're also up in the adenoids and tonsils, which is why, you know, when I see air, nose and throat doctors, just really having a pretty low threshold for removing kids, adenoids and tonsils, it really gives me pause because again, these are immune organs and there may be circumstances, you know, if somebody has terrible strep and an abscess or something and is colonized with that, they may need to be removed, but they're obviously, you know, think back to what I said about rewilding and repopulation rather than eradication in this time, in this sense, not just eradication of the organism, but eradication of the organ. So how can we make these organs healthier? How can we rewild our bodies so that we're not having these recurrent infections? What I want to show you with this slide is the thin layer right here, one cell thick, what's called the epithelial cell layer. This is a physical barrier between what's inside your gut and the rest of your body. Because remember, when you eat food and it goes through your 30 foot digestive superhighway, it's not actually inside your body. It is in this tunnel that leads from your mouth down your esophagus, into your stomach, through the three parts of your small intestine, the du du duodenum, jejunum, and ileum, into your colon, the large intestine. It comes first to the cecum, up the ascending colon, across the transverse colon, down the descending colon, into the sigmoid colon, rectum, anus, out. And all the time that the food and the products of digestion and the millions of bacteria and viruses that you ingest every day also, while they're in that digestive tunnel, they are protected, or rather the, you, the rest of your body, your heart, lungs, your innards are protected by this epithelial cell layer. So your innards are not actually your digestive tract. When I say innards, I mean those critical organs are all protected from the outside world, because your digestive tract is the outside world. It just happens to be bifurcating your body. 
So they're all protected by that cell layer. And that cell layer is porous. It's like a fishing net. It has fine little holes in it. And so as the food gets digested and broken down into its constituent parts, it is able to selectively get absorbed through that net. But the net, the goal of the net is also to keep, for example, toxins, poorly digested food particles, things like that, viruses outside of your body. Now, what can happen, of course, is that net can get damaged. So when you think about what happens when you take a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, NSAIDs like Motrin, those drugs keep me in business as a gastroenterologist. And when I do endoscopy on people, I see little erosions or sometimes big ulcers. And those are literally holes in your gut lining made by those drugs. So even when you don't have an actual big ulcer that I can see or an erosion, those drugs are still typically making uh, little holes in the net. Antibiotics can do it. Infections can do it. Viral, parasitic, fungal, bacterial infections, alcohol, too much of that. So all of these things can harm that gut lining. And when you think about it, this one cell layer, like a razor thin edge is the only thing protecting your internal organs from the outside world. Like you have better take care of this membrane and make sure that it doesn't break down on you. And when it does, that's something that we call leaky gut or an increase in intestinal permeability. So again, on one side of this layer, we have our gut bacteria, these trillions of microbes. And on the inside, just inside, right down here, on the other side of this one cell layer, we have the immune system. We have all these different cells, the T cells and B cells and plasma cells that make antibodies. And it is really a hand in glove relationship between what's going on with the microbes and what's going on with the immune system. And I'll give you an example. The only thing I want you to remember from this slide is what's going on at the top. These three things, fiber, gut bacteria, it's gut microbiota, that's another term for the microbiome, and these things, short chain fatty acids. Remember I mentioned them earlier and I told you I was coming back. So here's an example, butyrate, propionate, acetate, or sometimes called butyric acid, propionic acid, acetic acid. These short chain fatty acids are the metabolites. They are the byproducts of bacterial fermentation of fiber. And as you'll see in this little schematic here, they guide the immune system towards inflammation or away from inflammation. So you can have a pro-inflammatory reaction or an anti-inflammatory reaction, depending on whether you're eating enough fiber so that your gut bacteria have that substrate to ferment to produce these short chain fatty acids. So don't worry about IL-18 and GPR-109A and goblet cells and neutrophil chemotaxis. That is not important. What is important is that you understand when you are eating a high fiber diet, you are producing, you are not producing, you are feeding your gut bacteria indigestible plant fiber, which is the main, and in some cases, the only source that those bacteria need for fermentation to produce short chain fatty acids, which then guide your immune system, okay?